Hello and welcome to ATM World News. I'm Leah and it's great to be with you, the viewers all around the world. Today, this is one of the most exciting interviews that I have ever done because we are here with the one and the only Tommy James. Hi, Tommy. How you doing? Great to talk with you. Oh, it's great to be with you also. Listen, I'm just beyond excited. His music defined the decades he lived through. Let's go ahead and start this off with saying 23 gold singles, people, and nine platinum albums. I mean, amazing. Listen, Tommy is such a wonderful fellow, and uh, I believe he's someone that uh, God has been able to work with and and do many things with things that you see and things that you don't see behind the scenes uh and with that i'd like to open this up because he has an astounding uh autobiography called uh, me the mob and the music and it is mind-boggling uh what happened with uh tommy here's a young kid and can you imagine a mobster trapping you in a corner where you really can't get out and he had these options of big labels everybody wanted him he was talented capital record rca they wanted to work with tommy but something happened overnight he started getting calls where they were scared and started backing away you want to share that with us tommy sure um, my first record, Hanky Panky, that I actually recorded back in high school uh, in 1960, late 1963, uh, and was released in 64, um, you know, was it was a song that uh, uh, came out in my little hometown of Niles, Michigan, and, uh, uh, you know, was popular back then, but we had no distribution. So uh, the record just kind of died. And I uh, graduated from high school in 65. I hope you don't mind if I get a little long-winded with this, because I got to tell the story right. In 1965, I graduated from high school, and I took my band on the road. And, uh, you know, we we're playing clubs in the Midwest. And uh, right in the middle of my two weeks, uh, in a, a dumpy little club called in in in, in uh, Wisconsin, I uh, the, the, uh, and I was, I was playing for two weeks. That's what I'm saying. And right in the middle of my uh, my two weeks, the club owner gets shut down by the IRS for not paying his taxes. So we get sent home. But that's how the good Lord works. Because as soon as I got home. This is early 66, by the way. This is uh, about March of 66. As soon as I got home, I got the telephone call that changed my life. Um, a promoter in Pittsburgh and, a, and the distributor, local distributor, uh, called me up and informed me that this record that I had um, recorded two years earlier, Hanky Panky, was suddenly sitting at number one in the city of Pittsburgh. And I said, who is this? <laughs> you know, I didn't believe it was who he said he was. So he convinced me he was. And so they asked me if I'd come to Pittsburgh and do some TV and radio. And so I said, sure. So uh, the original record producer and myself, we went to Pittsburgh. I couldn't put the original band together. I went alone. And sure enough, I got there and Hanky Panky's number one in the city of Pittsburgh. They had bootlegged the record and sold about 80,000 of them in 10 days. And we were sitting at number one. So I picked up the first group I could find I uh, to be the new Shondells. Um, uh, uh, we headed for New York and a week later, we're sitting in New York City and we're gonna send, sell the master. And so my new manager that I also picked up in Pittsburgh uh, hooked me up with some record people and we were shopping the record. So we we got a yes from everybody. Got a yes from Columbia, from RCA, from Atlantic, uh, Kamasutra Records, um, 
And the last place we took the record to was Roulette Records. And so uh, Roulette was an interesting place. We had heard they were a bit mobbed up, but uh, I didn't care. Just, you know, take the record there, see what they say. So we had gotten a yes from everybody. And so I went to bed that night feeling really great uh, because um, we were probably going to be on one of the big corporate labels and uh, probably CBS or Atlantic or something like that. So the next morning, about 10 o'clock, I start getting calls from all the other record companies that had said yes the day before, all telling me that, listen, Tom, we, uh, we, get, we just got to pass. And I said, what do you mean you got to pass? I thought we had a deal. And finally, Jerry Wexler up at Atlantic Records uh, told us the truth, that Morris Levy, the head of Roulette Records, had called all the other record companies and scared him to death. He says, this is my record. Back off. And that's just the way he talked, too, right out of central casting in the movies. I'm not kidding. So uh, we were apparently going to be on Roulette. And so we met with them, and sure enough, uh, we signed with Roulette. And uh, But what we didn't know is that uh, when we signed with Roulette, we were, we were, get, we were sort of in trouble because uh, Roulette Records, in, in addition to being a, a, a good indie label, and they had had a lot of hits, uh, Roulette was also a front for the Genovese crime family in New York. We had no idea. And uh, so while we were hanky panky in and moany moany in this very dark and sinister story was going on behind us that we couldn't talk about. They indeed took hanky panky to number one in the nation and all over the world. And it turned out to be one of the biggest records in the summer of 66. And that began my career. I'm sorry to get uh, so long-winded on this, but I wanted to tell the story in sequence so that you would know uh, what I was talking about. That's that's the way it happened. And, um, you know, Roulette ended up, we ended up having 23 gold records on Roulette. Well, actually 21 uh, on Roulette and two other places. But we ended up with nine platinum albums and uh, did about 110 million records uh worldwide while we were with roulette so uh, i don't think we would have ever had the kind of success that we had if we had been on another label if we had been with cbs or rca i can tell you right now we would have been especially with a fluky record like hanky panky we would have been turned over to uh, an in-house a and r man and uh, an in-house producer. And that's probably the last time anybody would have heard from us. We would have been lucky to have been a one-hit wonder. The competition would have been unbelievable. And, um, you know, I would have never been allowed to run my own career. At Roulette, they actually needed us. And they needed, uh, they needed us to run our own run our own uh, production and everything and so as a result of being on roulette i got to know my craft i got to know the record business from the ground level up so anyway that's that's the story of how i got into the business well this is the stuff that hollywood stories are made of and that's why they are doing a movie of his book uh, it just got delayed a little bit because of this covid thing but you know, a movie will be coming out. It's going to be, uh, I mean, it's a page turner, people. You take the book and you keep reading. You know, it's fascinating. Um, I, I even rejoiced along with you as you were starting off and becoming so excited about the groups you were meeting. All the, the mamas and the papas and all the, I mean, you were just listing them when you were meeting them at these same places that you were going to in a station wagon. <laughs> But you know, that's a long story. They had to travel on their own and, you know, do all this stuff. But they were meeting groups that they were fans of. And sure. um, it, it was exciting, you know, as they were uh, climbing up the ladder. Um, but there was 
um, something that a lot of people didn't know. I know that during this time, music wise, there was something going on called the uh, Jesus People Movement music. But, you know, Tommy James being a top high ender hit a uh, top star in the world was doing his own kind of version, like with Crystal Blue Persuasion, Cherry Wine. People didn't know. Uh, uh, if they listened, they could know. But but these were totally uh, like Christian. And he was doing his own thing there with it in the top hits. And he pulled it off. That's amazing. Well, well thank you. you. Well, you know, back then, there was no such thing as political correctness back in the 60s, thankfully. And we were allowed to uh, talk about anything that would make a hit record. You know, we were we were left alone. I, I must say also that uh, I was very thankful to be left alone. Um, we were allowed to write our own music, uh, uh, put our own production team together, and and really uh, learn the industry. Uh, that would have never happened anywhere else. And uh, yes, it's true that in 19... 67, uh, I was, uh, happened to watch a, a Billy Graham crusade out at uh, Shea Stadium. And uh, uh, I had it on TV and I'm, I'm writing a song. I don't know, even know what, which song it was, but um, it was shortly after I think we're alone now. I do remember that. And uh, uh, on TV was Billy Graham, and uh, I always liked Billy Graham. I always liked to listen to him, but I listened to him in a very special way that night. And um, he was very succinctly and very beautifully telling the story, a simple story of why Jesus came. And I stopped writing, and I turned up the TV, and I'm listening, and I'm listening. And uh, I just was very moved by that story. And uh, I didn't realize all the little details and all the things that really mattered. And I got saved that night. And I went down to the TV. I'm sure I did retinal damage of some kind. I got down the TV and I put my hand on the screen and uh, uh, Got saved that night. I remember hearing that beautiful song, Just As I Am, that always is at the end of every Billy Graham crusade. And uh, every time I hear that song now, uh, I feel like I just went home. And uh, it's just a, a, a wonderful feeling every time I hear that song. And, and I got saved that night and uh, it changed my life. It definitely um, does change your life. If you don't know Jesus, man, look at Tommy. He got help by him. You can get some help from him. Larry Norman uh, wrote wrote a song about why don't you look into Jesus? He's got the answer. And um, a famous um, hit singer of the 60s sang it, actually. But I think that during the 60s, 70s, people were seekers. They were looking into things. They were looking for answers, the young people. And what Tommy did, though, is he provided some, uh, well, they called it, he wasn't gearing it towards this. They called it bubblegum uh, rock, but it was uh, the type of music that people needed to, you know, be bought by and get through the day. And um, I love Crimson and Clover. I think we all do. It's melodic. Um, you just, It's poetic. And he just woke up one morning and thought of it, Crimson and Clover. And I can uh -huh. remember as a little kid hearing it going, this guy must like those colors. Maybe that's why he chose it. <laughs> and, then, and then you did say you do like the colors. It makes you think of Valentine's and white and whatever, right? Crimson well, and yeah, Clover was amazing. Crim Crimson, Crimson and Clover was really just two of my favorite words uh, put together. It sounded profound. I had no idea what it meant. I mean, we had to make it mean something. 
we actually wrote three different versions of Crimson and Clover before we came came on to the one we we finally put out as a record. Mm. But I was so lucky uh, and and so blessed uh, because uh, we had the attention of the public uh, for such a long stretch. I don't think that would ever happen today. Um, radio was so good to me and and uh, stuck with us and uh, everything we put out, they played and it was really wonderful. Uh, uh, back starting with the, the old AM radio days because the entire nation was basically covered by about a dozen 50,000 watt stations. And, uh, you know, every station had tens of millions of listeners. It wasn't like today where you have just a tiny little fraction of people listening. Uh, so it was, it was huge. And so uh, they played all my music and uh, we were very lucky to just have one hit after another. Um, when I began producing the group, I wasn't producing the group at first, but when I began pr producing the group, um, I sort of combined my Christianity with uh, the records that I was making. Because I, I think a single is a snapshot of what you're feeling at any given moment in your career. So uh, when we started with uh, really with the Crimson and Clover album, it was after Moni Moni, we, we, we started with the Crimson and Clover album. And um, I started producing the group uh, by myself. And uh, uh, we started writing new things. Uh, Crimson and Clover, just so you know, was probably next to Hanky Panky, our first record, it was probably the most important record I ever made because it allowed us to jump and to, to, to make the move from AM top 40 singles uh, to FM progressive album rock and start selling albums. And I don't think any single we ever put out would have done that in one shot like Crimson and Clover did. So uh, we, were suddenly, we suddenly had a whole new audience and we, it gave us the second half of our career. And we began writing songs like uh, Crystal Blue Persuasion, which uh, really is a song about becoming a Christian. Um, they tried to make it about drugs, but that wasn't what it was about. And uh, uh, so I, I was very thankful that that record hit for us because it also changed. Crimson and Clover changed our style. Uh, Crystal Blue really changed our message. And uh, the same with Sweet Cherry Wine. Sweet Cherry Wine was about the blood of Jesus. And um, as I said, I don't think today you could put out a record like that and expect it to jump into the top 40. And all these records went uh, top 10 and top five for us. Crimson and Clover went number one. So it began a whole new phase of our career. Uh, as I said, both in the style and in uh, the message. So uh, I was very thankful uh, for that moment. And it gave us uh, a lot more time on the charts and a lot more time on the radio. So. Anyway, that's how Crimson and Clover worked for us. Oh, I, I got to tell you, coolest thing ever. He's highly creative. You just let him loose with anything. He can take anything, put it together, and make it smooth and sound really good. He's got an album called Alive, where he took Drag in the Line, which I really like, uh, and he put it some rap in it. And somebody may say, no, you're kidding me. Oh, that'll change the whole song. I want to tell you, it was a major success. And he, well, was able, he was able to put in more of his view of thinking about how you can live your life. You know, hey, you can sit on a stoop. You can sit out here. You can go to the beach. He was like teaching people how to like get them out of their blue funk or something, right? 
Isn't well, yeah, the, the, you know, uh, uh, I, one, a very talented rapper who's just a great guy and a, uh, a Christian and a, and a very highly respected uh, talent. Uh, his name is Tone Z. He's a, a, a he's won Grammys. Um, he uh, came in the studio and did a rap to Dragon the Lion. We re-recorded Dragon the Lion a little different way. And uh, he, he came in and did a rap uh, in, in three spots uh, on the song. And he did a beautiful job. I said, that's great, let's, let's put that up. So it went on the album. Stevie Van Zant played guitar, by the way, on that oh, record. Oh, cool. And um, uh, Tone Z and I did a, a cover of the Rolling Stones, uh, The Last Time. This could be the last time. And uh, he, he, he did the same kind of a thing. And uh, uh, he just, it was so great working with him. And I just I felt like, um, you know, we could basically do anything. The album you're referring to, uh, Alive, was an album that uh, we put out in 2019. Mm. And it was um, uh, the first album that I had done in 10 years studio new studio album and we put it out on our label aura records and the first two singles that we put out from the album the album went top 20 for us adult contemporary and the first two singles that we put out um also uh went uh, top 20. um and i was so glad to be back on the charts um after all that time it was great and uh, we also put on the album we put uh, a, a a song that's going to be in in the in our movie. Uh, it was a new version of I think we're alone now. That we, uh, slow and acoustic and very very different from the version of I think we're alone now that we did back in 1967. And. Uh, uh, and that also went top 20 for us. So uh, I'm just I'm just thrilled that we're still able to do this. I'm very, very thankful. Oh, yeah. You know, that slower version uh, made it sound more of a soft, romantic love song. It's going to be in the movie. It's going to be uh, over the closing credits in the film. Mm. And the song is basically at a moment in, in the movie where Morris Levy... Uh, it's a true story where Morris Levy passes away and um, we are alone, you know, without Morris. And it's a strange, I'm telling you, I had such mixed feelings about, yeah, I know. you know, Morris Levy and the whole scene up there at Roulette because it really was mob run, but yet they, I, I owed them so much for my career they gave me a, a, a you know put food on my table for uh you know 50 plus years and um i would have never as i said would have never had the kind of success uh at, at any other label i don't think um, unfortunately just, they stole his royalties though people like millions but crime doesn't crime doesn't pay but Tommy has the last laugh. He'll get it back with his book and his movie about what they did. And he'll make it back that way. I was talking with Tommy before the interview saying that he nailed an impression of Morris Levy like nobody else could. Um, I listened to the original newsreels uh, from the early 80s of Morris Levy. And when I heard it's called One Hell of a Ride, because that's what Morris would say to him. He sounded just like Morris Levy. And uh -huh. I was suggesting, hey, why don't you do his voice in your movie at the end when you have an imaginary conversation with him? Like he said, you might do at the end because he sounds just like him. That's because he was around him so much. Yeah. Uh, but I can imagine emotionally, I want to ask you this question. I, I don't know. Emotionally, it must have been rough because he was kind of like a in a weird way a father figure to you 
an and abusive that, father. And, and an a, abusive father. An abusive you know, father, bad, but I think he really liked you. Right? We had we did, and we understood each other. It was a strange relationship. It really was. It was um we had a lot of respect for each other in a left-handed kind of way. Um Morris, I always reminded me of an abuse. It was like an abusive father-son relationship where, you know, the the dad slaps the kid around, but he sends him to college. But that's kind of how it was. And um, so it was a very human story. And and I, you know, the strange part is I really miss the guy. I really miss Morris. Um, uh, we had a lot of laughs together, strangely enough, and we uh, we we made a lot of music together. I mean, and the funny part about it is Morris was every bit a thug. There was no doubt about it. But he had great ears. I mean, he really could hear hits. And he, he would have been a great record man uh, without all the other stuff. Uh, but he just He's one of the most fascinating people I ever met. He just shows the dark side of everything. Uh, he, you know, and it was a choice yeah. because Morris was really smart. And he really, uh, and uh, I mean, he, he Morris uh, was such an interesting character. Uh, but he was, he just, couldn't seem to stop himself from choosing the the, the dark side. You know, and, that, uh, that is so sad. Let's hope that at the end, when he was in the hospital dying, that something came to him to repent. Let's just hope for that. I would have loved to have been there and, and, and been that person. I know. He called for me and asked me to come. And I was in Chicago uh, doing a concert. Uh, he died in 1990. Um, incidentally, my 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 father, my dad, uh, and Morris Levy died the same year of the same thing. Oh my goodness! And uh, it was so. It was. It was. There's a lot of different angles to this. But yeah. Morris asked me to come uh, and be with him, and I couldn't get back till the following day, and it was one day too late. Mm. He he died as when I was when I came off stage uh, in Chicago mm. in uh, the spring of 1990, and uh, uh, so I never got a chance to say goodbye. And I don't know what he would have said, but at the very end of the film, uh, we have so I get in the limo after the show, going back to the hotel, and have a sort of imaginary conversation with Morris. So the things that I would have said. That and, would be uh, interesting to see. Yeah. Yeah. And the things I think he would have said to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that, that would be amazing. Absolutely amazing. And people, I wanted you to also know if you want to hear more of Tommy that what he has uh, going on now is something called Getting Together with Tommy James. It's on Sirius X, is it 17? <laughs> Sundays at 5 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that's serious. That's serious XM radio. XM, that's uh, right. Okay. And the and phone number, if you want to leave a message, which is the coolest thing ever, people, if you really love him and really want to leave a message, is 833-866-6974. Yes, I said it because I think it's the coolest thing ever that somebody will give a number where you can leave a message for them. That's cool. You must really love your fans. Well, they call and I play them on the radio. You know, I pick a couple of songs or a couple of calls every week and um, play them and so I, the fans get to say what they have to say and that's it just 833 tommy show t-o-m-m-y s-h-o-w 833 oh, cool. tommy show that and also awesome. uh, so we're on every uh every sunday 
uh, from five to eight on channel 73. It's uh, 60s Gold is the name of the channel, 60s Gold. So I've been doing it, for this is our sixth year, and uh, it's so fun. It was such a great way to stay in touch with the fans uh, during COVID because they shut the concert business down. And so I could talk to the fans over the radio. And, uh, and now it's not only, it's, it's all, it's the satellite, it goes all over North America, the US and Canada. But now with the Sirius XM app, it's all over the world. So everybody can hear. And uh, I'm very lucky to be doing that. It's a wonderful way to stay in touch with people. Wow. It really and we're is. touring. We're touring all over the country. I, I don't so know where you get this energy from. You are so youthful. Look at him, people. Doesn't he look young? I mean, seriously, he, <laughs> he looks decades younger than his actual age. And I'm thinking, you're touring. That takes it out of you. You are really imbued with extra strength from on high, dude. It's amazing all what you're doing, touring, and then this radio. I just can't get over it. But people go oh, to his website so you can see if he's going to be in your area. So you just can TommyJames.com. Yeah, yeah. So you can uh, catch a concert and um, keep in touch and see his latest releases. Your latest single is about is about the city. Uh, what was it about your latest CD? Uh, well, the latest CD, you mean uh, Alive? Is that what you're referring to? Uh, well, there's one you've got coming out soon, isn't it? Where it's like- Okay, sure, sure, sure. Okay, we uh, uh, have two uh, cat catalog albums, which means that, you know, older, older material that's that's out on the market uh, in a fresh new way. We have uh, an album called uh, Now, right now in the stores. And we have another album called uh, Tommy James and the Shondells 40 Years. And it was uh, a compilation of, of our singles from 1966 to 2006. Yeah. And uh, that's that's just it's a double CD um, and it's in the store now on our website uh, or, uh, you know, Amazon or any, anywhere records are sold. So, you know, we've got a lot of material out there and uh, uh, I'm very thankful. It's, it's really interesting because Roulette Records has now been purchased by Warner Brothers. Oh, wow. So all of the all of all of the music now is on Warner Brothers uh, and on our label Aura Records and Sony Music uh, is uh, the uh, owns the publishing and all that stuff and they also represent me in films, uh, music and films, uh, commercials, and uh, on TV. So uh, we're with the best people now. We've come a long way from Roulette Records. Um, but Roulette Records is where it all started. Well, Tommy, I thank you for taking time out of your extremely busy schedule to share with our audience. We are beyond blessed. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great talking with you. Let it really was. Here. Until next time, I'm Leah reminding you that God loves you. <laughs>